Hey, Mr. P here. This is a video on natural selection specifically. And so in the last video, we talked in depth about the mechanisms and the evidence for evolution. But now we need to kind of dive into what is the ultimate driving force of evolution. And the answer to that is natural selection. OK, um, you often hear natural selection as a term kind of used interchangeably to evolution. Um, natural selection is not kind of a, a replacement for evolution. Natural selection is definitely tied to evolution. Natural selection is the driving force of evolution. So evolution is the cumulative change um, or the overall cumulative change of the uh, genetics within a population over time. Natural selection is a force by which those genetic changes change over time. So let's dive into exactly what uh, natural selection is and how it leads to evolution of a population over time. So uh, we've talked in depth about what the idea of evolution is. We've talked about evidence for evolution and why it's kind of highly regarded uh, within the scientific community. Um, we just need to talk about kind of what drives evolution. How does evolution come about? What changes um, environmentally and what changes genetically within a population of a particular species um, really kind of gets at the the large-scale change that we see uh, often take place within a population or within a species of organisms over time. And so how does this particular mechanism work? Um, the first thing you have to understand is it starts with uh, the overproduction of offspring, which means that we are overproducing our carrying capacity. We as a particular species, and I say we, I'm talking in, in the case of all living things, right? The goal of living things is to definitely produce offspring to carry on genetics from one generation to the next. Um, one way to ensure population or species success is by overproducing the offspring. We know that certain offspring are going to die. We know that certain individuals within our population are going to die before becoming reproductive successful. Um, and so we're, we're, we're playing into that, right? We need to produce enough offspring so that when those specific uh, individuals die, we have enough kind of in reserve to ensure the success of our population over time. Um, and um, in the presence of this natural variation, we need to produce enough offspring, but we need to produce offspring that naturally uh, vary from one individual to the next. If we can overproduce our offspring and we can ensure that the offspring are receiving a variety of traits, then we can ensure that our species and our population as a whole will be successful uh, moving forward into the future. Okay, because there is a struggle of existence or a struggle for existence within any population, within any environment, within any biome on the planet. Okay, um, this struggle, as is outlined later in the lecture, is going to really at the at the soul um, of this struggle is competition. Right? There's competition for mates. There's competition for resources. There's competition for space. There's competition for food and water. There is competition, healthy competition, for a variety of resources within a particular species, within a particular population at any given moment. This competition ensures that those individuals that are more fit are going to survive, increased chances of survival, and unfortunately it's going to ensure that we kill off or it's going to ensure that there is death for others. Now. Um, in a perfect world, like everybody would reproduce, everybody would live a prosperous life, but we know that that is not the case. Um, healthy competition and healthy struggle between individuals of a population is vital to ensuring the long-term success of that particular species. We want to ensure that the strongest and most intelligent and hardiest and most resistant to change um, are going to survive and reproduce and pass those really fit genes on to their offspring so that their offspring can become more fit and pass those genes on to the next offspring so that those uh, offspring can be more fit. And so we can increase the overall fitness of the particular population as we move into the future. 
Now, we want to ensure death for others because we don't want those less fit genes in the population because it's going to um, water down or take away from the, the, the increased fitness genes um, that we're trying to pass on to future generations. And so if we look just at this really simple diagram, it's very simple, right? We overproduce um, our offspring, right? We produce a lot of offspring so that we can ensure that there is natural variation within within the population, you'll see that there are darker individuals, there are lighter individuals, there are taller individuals, there are shorter individuals, um, and just naturally, selection's gonna take place. Those organisms that are more fit, stronger, can run faster, can, can reach and secure food and resources at an easier rate, um, are going to reproduce, and those individuals that are less fit are going to die, and the individuals that are selected for are going to therefore uh, produce offspring with those particular traits in mind and so it leads to adaptation which means our population adapted and has evolved um, and you will see that this population the the allele frequency or the color distribution in this case is much different in this population than it was in this population what do you notice um, there must be some kind of selective pressure that is selecting for the dark skin coloration or the, the dark fur coloration because all of the individuals that were less fit that died in this particular population are light and uh, and therefore didn't really produce much light offspring um, as we moved into the future generations which is kind of denoted by this the end of the graph right um, very kind of 50 50 but as we get to the end it's it's very 75 percent dark 25 percent light so that tells you that there was a selective pressure that selected for dark uh, and a selective pressure that selected against light so now we can take a look at kind of what this variation within populations really means for the particular population or for the particular species but uh, we're going to look at it from kind of a pro and con angle as well. And so we know that, that sexual reproduction, sexually reproducing organisms, leads to genetic diversity while asexual reproducers um, often don't. Okay, and, and the reason for that is going to be outlined in, in a little bit, but um, sexual reproduction leads to genetic diversity and a wide variety of offspring because of the fact that sexual reproducers are, in a sense, shuffling the gene pool. They are taking genes from one individual and they're mixing them with genes from another individual to produce offspring combinations that have never been produced before. So sexual reproducers leads to a greater or often great genetic diversity and a wide variety of offspring. So we've talked in the last slide about the importance of variety and the importance of producing a lot of those offspring. So um, we want to produce a lot of the offspring. We also want to produce uh, a great or a diversity, a great variety of those organisms so that we can ensure that um, there are a variety of options for becoming the most fit and there are a variety of options for being the less fit. Variation within a population leads to greater survival of the species. We've talked about that before, right? We want a lot of offspring, but we also want great uh, variation of those offspring. The more diversity... Uh, witnessed within a pro particular population is going to increase the chances of survival within a species. And so then we have a variety of these options or a variety of examples. Um, and so the first thing we're going to look at is baby bird pigmentation might lead to greater camouflage from predator predators. Uh, when we see any organism, whether it be bird, fish, mammal, amphibian, reptile, whatever, um, a variety of organisms tend to have a great deal of camouflage for their particular environment, right? It leads to um, greater success and greater chances of surviving that particular environment. Um, but what if a baby bird uh, within a clutch of babies has just a slight edge, a slightly more successful camouflage than uh, the the peers that it was born with. Um, you would think or say that it probably has a greater chance of survival, and even if it has a 1% chance or an increase by 1%, it's 1% it's more likely to survive. That is substantial um, and could potentially lead to uh, even greater camouflage by its chicks. Um, and so if we look at that, we can also say, but what if the trait doesn't provide an advantage? What if a, a, a baby bird is born with a 1% decreased fitness, meaning it has a slightly less camouflage? 
right? A 1% change in a baby bird's feather pigmentation could be advantageous, but it could just as easily be um, a disadvantage. Um, something to think about, right? Um, if it is advantage to the bird, it's probably going to be selected for, and if it is a disadvantage for the bird, it, it's going to have a greater disadvantage. It's probably going to be harder for that particular baby bird in and amongst its peers to survive and reproduce, right? So now look at what if we look at fish, right? A fish with a slightly different shaped mouth may be able to feed from a section of the coral that other fish of that particular population can feed from. If it can um, be opportunistic and if it can feed on untapped resources, so to speak, it's probably going to be um, increased fitness, right? Or it's gonna lead to an increased fitness. But just like the baby bird example, if that mouth is misshaped slightly the opposite direction, right, and gives the fish the inability or a decreased ability to feed from the coral reefs, it's probably not going to survive and definitely not going to reproduce, right? So a, a slight mouth deviation can be positive or negative in this particular example. And the last one we're going to talk about is plant and flower shape, right? Flowers and uh, uh, flowers are the reproductive structures of angiospermophyta, right? So when we have a flowering plant, those flowers are the reproductive structures. So the flower is directly tied to reproductive success. A plant flower that has a slightly different shaped flower than others of that particular population might have a greater chance of attracting insects or birds for pollination. But as you'd guessed it, uh, that, that flower could be misshapen to the point where it inhibits pollinator access. And if that plant um, indirectly or just just randomly mutates to inhibit pollinator access, it's going to decrease the fitness of that particular plant and therefore decrease the opportunity or the, the success, decrease the ability to reproduce. And if you at all, within any population, decrease the ability to reproduce, you are greatly handicapping that, that organism's ability to pass its traits on to the, the next generation, right? The only way an organism can pass its traits on to the next generation is by reproducing. Right. So three examples, pros and cons. Right. Uh, all three examples talk in depth about a, a slight deviation from the norm. If that deviation is successful, um, it promotes fitness. And if that deviation is negative, it's going to promote um, a decreased fitness. Uh, those that are increase fitness are going to reproduce at a higher rate, pass its offspring or pass its traits on to the offspring at a higher rate. Those organisms that are at a disadvantage are going to reproduce at a, a lower or slower rate, um, and that's greatly going to impact the number of genes or the, the variety of genes moving forward within a population. So after all of that, if we kind of summarize, hopefully uh, through those three examples, you can see uh, a direct correlation between variation and success. The greater the amount of variation, as variation goes up, the success goes up, okay? Variation or variety is very closely aligned or related to how successful an organism is, right? Um, we have to produce a lot of or organisms, a lot of offspring, and we have to produce those offspring with a variety of traits. That is how the population and the species as a whole can ensure success moving into the future. Variation within population is only possible if there are multiple alleles for a particular gene, right? Multiple alleles we will talk about later in the syllabus, or we've talked uh, at depth already, uh, depending on kind of your place in the course. But multiple alleles are just the, the number and variety of alleles available to a particular organism uh, that are available within the population, right? An example of that multiple allele discussion was blood typing. Right, human blood type is is controlled by multiple alleles. It's a multiple allele mode of inheritance. We have blood type um, A, we have blood type B, and we have blood type O. Depending on the variety of alleles you get, really dictates what blood type you are. You could be homozygous A. You could be heterozygous A. Right, and I'm not going to get into kind of a, a mode of inheritance kind of section within this video, but you know that based on how these alleles assort um, and come together through the process of, of uh, inheritance and uh, independent assortment leads to uh, a variety of blood types within a population. So it's definitely tied to this variation. 
when we have this variation or when you can see or witness the variation within a population it it increases the success of the population because we are less susceptible to large-scale die-off based on the variation within the population right so if we think about that in terms of the peppered moth you just watched or should have watched the peppered moth video if you haven't go back and watch uh, we talked a, in depth about a case study related to the peppered moth, and we saw that there was, in fact, variety within the population. Um, and based on environmental factors, the, the, the phenotype of that particular moth changed from the wild type, kind of white and black speckled, to the dark, melanistic uh, variety based on environmental factors, right? The, uh, the, the pollution kind of coated the environment in a black soot um, and it really led to a great disadvantage for the white and black variety and led to a great advantage for the black variety and so the the population as a whole shifted from being predominantly black and white to being predominantly black only okay so the dark coloration was produced by a mutation just randomly it was if you remember just uh, available to about one percent of the population but that 1% advantage, given the right environmental influences or right environmental selective pressures, really led to a large-scale change, which is evolution, right? It gave some members dark pigmentation, and those individuals that had the dark pigmentation um, as the result of the environmental change led to an increased camouflage, and they, they were obviously more successful, and they, they completely flip-flopped the uh, the distribution of that allele within the population okay asexual reproduction equals no variation why because asexual reproduction is essentially a clone and so if we look at it in terms of bacteria because obviously bacteria are probably the most well-known asexual reproducers um, we humans uh, as well as other organisms within kind of the kingdom of um, eukarya are going to produce offspring via sexual reproduction but bacteria, on the other hand, are asexual reproducers, which means they are cloning themselves um, and producing no variation in the process. So they can make a lot of themselves, but they can't produce much variety. Now, there are natural variations within the population, but those come about as the, re the result of mutations. But in an asexual reproduction kind of scenario, one bacteria cell would become two, two would become four, four would become eight, 8 would become 16, and all 16 would be exactly the same. And so if we added an antibiotic, which we often do to cure ourselves of bacterial infections, we add an antibiotic to our, our population of bacteria that are making us sick, because there is no variation, that antibiotic, assuming there isn't any resistance, will kill off the entire population, which is good for us. And so asexual reproduction does not promote variety. All members of the population are identical, and there is a very, very serious consequence as the result of not providing variety within your population, and it's because natural selection only leaves two choices. You either survive as a population as a whole, or you die as a population as a whole. And luckily for us, in the case of bacteria, we have ways to essentially eradicate almost the entire population, or at least lower the population numbers uh, back to kind of healthy, normal levels, right? Um, organism populations that have a great deal of variety often don't have the same large-scale die-off uh, that populations that don't have variation do. Okay, and so what are the ways that an organism or a particular species can increase variation within their population? Uh, very simple, right? These are the mechanisms that drive variation. These are the things that give us the ability to promote variation within our species moving forward. And the first is mutations in DNA, okay? We have a, a, a code that we contain in every single cell in our body, and it's in the form of DNA right our DNA is literally the combination of both parents and so when we look at DNA deoxyribonucleic acid is a, a very complex molecule that has all of the informational code that makes us and every other organism alive on the planet who they are um, but just randomly we produce mutations 
Okay, how do we produce mutations? DNA, uh, when cells divide, or when cells replicate, they have to replicate or copy their DNA, right? You can't take a DNA molecule in one cell and divide it in half and give the two new cells that are produced by cell division a half copy of the DNA because then the cells would only have a partial code or a partial set of instructions on how to be the cell that it is. So that would be bad, right? So we have to duplicate the DNA in order to give both new cells that are undergoing uh, or that are produced via cell division a full copy of the DNA so that they are 100% familiar with the instructions necessary to be a cell within the eukaryotic cell that they are, right? Um, and so we naturally just randomly produce mutations uh, which are just copying errors, right? When you're transcribing a document or you're putting together a document, I think everybody's guilty of making typos on occasion, right? There's a reason why there's there's graphic or there's grammatical software built into every computer now, right? Um, grammatical errors, typos happen. It's just nature of of doing work, right? So when our DNA is actually replicating itself, it's very likely that typos will happen, um, and these typos are the mutations. It's just a random change to the DNA. Um, within a particular cell, within a particular organism. But um, the mutations aren't bad, right? Sometimes mutations are neutral, meaning they don't even show up. They don't even rear their head. You don't even know that the DNA mutated within that cell because it didn't do anything negative or positive. Um, sometimes mutations can be negative, right? Sometimes mutations can happen that, that greatly impacts the controlled mechanism of that particular cell, and it often can lead to cancer. Right, uh, cancer is essentially just kind of uncontrolled cell growth or unregulated cell growth. That's 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 just a random mutation that happens. Um, but sometimes mutations can produce characteristics that are advantageous to the organism, and that's really what we're talking about. Um, and the reason why mutations were put on this slide uh, when we talk about natural selection, right? These are the mutations that are leading to advantageous traits. These are the mutations that are possibly leading to just a slightly faster growth rate. They're leading to just a slightly better frost resistance for a particular plant. It makes them more successful in their environment. It might be that they're becoming slightly taller for reaching higher food sources that are unreachable by other members of that particular population. It could be that they are slightly more camouflaged uh, in a changing habitat. Right? Places on the planet are changing. Organisms are randomly mutating and those sometimes those random mutations line up perfectly to the changes that are happen, happening within the, the ecosystem or within the environment that that organism lives in which again solidifies kind of why um, mutations are important. We have to continually mu mu mutate the DNA. We have to continually change the, ver the variation of organisms within a population so that a changing environment has the ability to select four uh, organisms that are now better able to kind of adapt to that environment than others. And so each generation only produces a few gene mutations. Um, most are neutral, some can be negative, some can be positive, but because only a few gene mutations happen at each generation, you can see why it takes long times or large uh, numbers of generations to make large-scale changes in that particular phenotype to that particular population. Okay, the next is meiosis. Meiosis is the way in which sexual reproducers produce their gametes. Now, gametes are just the sex cells of a particular organism. Okay, so in males that would be sperm cells, in females that would be egg cells. Both of those are haploid gametes. The haploid or term haploid, as we've discussed in class before, is basically the, the term used to describe cells that have a single set of chromosomes, right? So sperm cells have a single set of chromosomes, egg cells have a single set of chromosomes so that when they come together they both join to produce the diploid cell that has two copies of each chromosome, which is really important because we're a diploid organism. Um, four cells are produced by each round of meiosis. You can see that one cell undergoes meiosis, so the one cell starts and four haploid daughter cells are produced. And you can see that based on just the, the generic shading or the, the very easy shading pattern of this uh, indicates that every single one of these cells is genetically different, right? They all have a different shading pattern or a different shading combination. 
Um, each of them contains roughly 50% of each parent, but which 50% they get from each gene from each parent dictate or, or differentiates uh, each of these cells. So each of these haploid cells are genetically unique, which again is is just proof that that sexual reproducers are ensuring variation within the population. Okay, not only are they getting uh, unique combinations of haploids that come together, but they're also um, promoting mutation and they're also coming together from organisms that have never made offspring before. Okay, it increases the variety, increases the variation within a particular population um, at every given kind of generation step. Sexual reproduction, just another one, right? Sexual reproduction, the coming together of a sperm cell and egg cell, really, really important to promote variation because things have to be right. Conditions have to be right. All the conditions within the inside of the female's body must be right at the correct time to allow fertilization to take place, um, which brings about the discussion of luck, right, and chance. Luck and chance definitely play into the ability for organisms to conceptual uh, or to, uh, to fertilize an egg, but, but we can't just say that all of life really is this game of love, uh, of chance, right? That would be unfair to say. Um, we cannot conclude, it would be unfair to conclude that all life is just a game of chance. It is not, right? There is definitely mechanisms at play that promote variation. Natural selection is driven by variation. It's driven by uh, competition. And then evolution is driven by natural selection. So there are selective kind of driving forces that really move this forward in a very predictable way. But within the steps of this driving mechanism, there is a, a, a glimmer of chance, right? It's just, there is a chance. There are individuals within a population that are killed that have great fitness, right? It's just chance. Some organisms die that have great fitness. Some organisms survive and reproduce at a high rate with less fitness. But for the most part, natural selection is driven by the struggle for survival and evolution is driven by natural selection. Okay, so let's map out kind of what variation within members of a particular species looks like and, and kind of map out what the, the driving forces of that variation within the population are. And so we're going to start with obviously random mutation, right? We already talked about this idea of random mutation. We know that mutations are negative, neutral, or positive. But all mutations come about as the result of kind of copying errors as the DNA uh, is replicated. Okay, so during DNA replication, there are often uh, typos that happen, that occur, uh, and um, it can be as simple as a neutral mutation, meaning that it isn't going to manifest, it's manifest itself within the organism and therefore isn't really going to increase or decrease its fitness, but those mutations will still be passed on to their organism offspring uh, because it still is a, a change of the DNA. And so if we look at DNA replication, we're going to talk about DNA replication or have talked about it uh, in the past. I'm going to talk about it again. We know that there are a variety of enzymatic actions that happen to correctly copy the DNA from one molecule to two molecules uh, so that we can ultimately divide the cell and give a copy to each of the cells. But in doing this DNA replication, there are so many enzymes at work that there often can be replication errors. And so if this is an A uh, and polymerase comes in and uh, inadvertently puts a G where it should be a T, you know that that is a base pair substitution, right? That is a mutation that is going to change the way the DNA is read. It's going to ultimately change the way the mRNA is made, and it's going to change the way the protein product is produced, right? It's going to tell the enzyme, or it's going to tell the organism um, the wrong set of instructions, right? We are changing the instructions for life, and so we we can ultimately, like I said, produce. Uh, positive or negative uh, adaptations as the result of these DNA mutations. Okay, that obviously promotes variation within a population. Another way to 
increase this idea of variation within a population through the use of mutations is, is through the vehicle of viral infection. Every time you're subjected to viral DNA, meaning you're infected with a virus, uh, the only way by which a virus, in this case a bacteriophage, okay, this is a virus that is specific to infecting bacteria cells, but uh, all viruses really share the same kind of anatomy. There is simply a DNA molecule within some kind of protein capsid or some type of protein coat, and the, the virus isn't alive. In fact, it requires a host cell in order to hijack its machinery and metabolism in order to produce more viral particles for it. Um, but because the virus is going to, in this case, inject the viral DNA into the cellular components of the bacteria cell, in this case, um, it's actually causing a mutation because it will implant its viral DNA within a section of normal bacteria DNA. Because of the viral DNA uh, injecting itself or becoming part of the bacterial genome, it therefore changes the sequence of DNA and can cause mutations to happen uh, as the result of, of just viral infection. Okay, And so that doesn't really change uh, in humans case, right, when you're subjected to the cold virus, the rhinovirus, or you're subjected to the flu, like influenza, um, each time you're subjected to these viral infections, you slightly or can potentially slightly change or alter your DNA. Um, and again, through both of these ideas, these random mutations can happen. Both promote variation within a population. They can be negative, they can be neutral, they can be positive, but uh, on the other side, kind of away from these random type things. Okay, viral infection is a random thing. DNA replication errors is a random thing. Um, the thing that really isn't random, um, so to speak, is sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is a way that that is guaranteed to produce variation based not only on the way gametes are produced, but based on the way organisms are actually produced via the sexual reproduction. One way that sexual reproduction is going to alter the variation or promote variation within members of species is through the idea or use of meiosis. Now, meiosis is the process of producing those haploid gametes, and during the production of those gametes, one of the ways that meiosis uh, improves or promotes variation is through this idea of crossing over. Now, what is crossing over? Crossing over is actually uh, a process of exchanging and recombining chromosomes, okay? And so homologous chromosomes, we know what those are. Homologous chromosomes are gonna to come together. This would be, let's say, um, paternal, and this is maternal, right? The paternal and maternal chromosome pair number one, perhaps, are going to come together in a, in a process uh, called synapsis. During synapsis, the synaptominal complex is going to hold these two homologous chromosomes together and while they are in close proximity to each other during prophase one of meiosis, they often will cross their legs or arms, but they will cross over each other. And because they cross over, they will exchange, essentially cut off each of their leg segments, and they will exchange that um, in a process of basically recombining uh, the chromatids, right? So we are going to physically cross over, that's why it's called crossing over, and because they are crossed over and so tightly aligned to each other, they will often actually exchange and recombine these chromatid sections to even further increase variation. Now we have a paternal chromosome that has maternal DNA on it, and we have a maternal chromosome that has paternal DNA on it. And so if this is the chromosome that is passed on, or this will eventually be the chromatid that is passed on to our offspring, this chromatid will contain not only maternal DNA, but paternal DNA for those particular genes on that particular chromosome. Okay, It's just a way of further uh, adding to the variation that we see within a population. Another way meiosis is going to promote variation is through this idea of random assortment. Okay, random assortment is, is literally just talking about how chromosomes line up and assort themselves during meiosis uh, through kind of just a chance event, right? This is just chance, it's luck. 
Um, but this is, let's say, potential arrangement. Oops. This is, let's say, potential arrangement number one. This is potential arrangement number two. And both are equally likely uh, events when we talk about potential combinations of chromatids as the as meiosis progresses. So this is meiosis. Obviously, we have one meiotic event over here. We have one meiotic event over here. Um, each of these potential arrangements are potential starting arrangements for the process of meiosis. And so if, if just by chance these four chromosomes line up in this orientation and then divide, you will get one of the paternal chromosomes, let's say the paternal chromosome for number, you know, pair number one goes here, maternal goes here, maternal chromosome for number two goes here, paternal goes here. Basically, we have one paternal, one maternal for chromosome pair number one and pair number two. They assort themselves out. We eventually get combination one, combination two. Both of these are different from these, okay? Just based on an, an alignment or an assortment uh, difference. Okay, now, if we think back to the original slide and we talk about how crossing over even furthers this idea of variation within a population, if these chromosomes crossed over at this point, they would even further differ or uh, increase variation within these combinations uh, even further, right? These are showing you meiosis. They're showing you how meiosis by itself or by this process of random assortment leads to increased uh, variety that we notice, uh, increased combination potential. But if we put random assortment alongside crossing over, then you can see how quickly even uh, further variation comes about. Okay. So these are ways that variation is promoted within a species, but one thing that we still haven't talked about that really ties sexual reproduction as a way of promoting variation is through this idea of random fertilization. During the production of the gametes, right, crossing over is a possibility. Random assortment is a possibility. We produced all the gametes, and now through this idea of random fertilization, just due to the sheer numbers of potential cells, okay, sheer number of potential sperm cells, sheer number of potential egg cells, you can quickly see how many different combinations, even using two chromosomes. And in cell, uh, human cells, we have 23 chromosomes within the mother egg, and we have 23 chromosomes within the uh, the sperm cell. Okay, so we've got sperm options over here. We have egg options over here. This shows you a very simple Punnett square uh, looking at just a mere two chromosomes each, right? This gives us two pairs of chromosomes. Human cells would have 46 total chromosomes, two pairs of 23. Uh, and so you can see that using just random fertilization, using crossing over, using independent assortment, and uh, the way the chromosomes line up, as well as all of these viral and DNA base substitution uh, mutations, all of these things are playing into this idea of promoting variation within a population. Really important. So the big question is to adapt or not to adapt. Now, individual species or individual organisms within a population really don't have the choice, right? Uh, they don't really choose whether or not their DNA mutates. They don't choose whether or not their chromosomes align themselves correctly within their gametes or to produce gametes. They can't really um, keep themselves safe from viral infection. They can't really uh, keep themselves safe from predation uh, or, or competition within the population as a whole. Uh, but what they can, what does happen is that, that advantage is going to be selected for. Mutations, changes in their DNA that give an organism an advantage are going to be selected for, and mutations and changes in their DNA that provide a disadvantage are going to be selected against. That is literally kind of rule one uh, of uh, and foundational for our understanding of natural selection as a driving force for evolution, right? Uh, advantageous traits are selected for, disadvantaged traits are selected against. Now, uh, kind of some some things to think about. Question, why do giraffes have such a long neck if they have the same number of vertebrae that humans do? I think that is a, a, a phenomenal question, right? Why does an organism like this have such a long neck in proportion to the rest of the body, 
when they have literally the exact same number of vertebrae that a human does. And honestly, I think you can look at just uh, the, the type of terrain they're living in and the type of resources they're utilizing, right? They live in the, the African savanna, right? You have trees, I think acacia trees are probably one of the preferred food sources for the giraffe, but they grow in very tall, kind of uh, very sparsely populated, at least low, uh, ways. And so these giraffes have to continuously get taller in order to utilize the resources that are available to them. Um, the shorter giraffes starve, the taller giraffes are successful and reproduce. And so over the course of several hundred thousand years or even a million years, the giraffe has, tr has continuously gotten taller. Um, I think you could say the opposite for humans, right? There is no selective pressure that selects humans as being increased fit or decreased fit uh, on neck length. And so there there hasn't been a, a, a push to increase our neck length. It doesn't impact our ability to survive and navigate our environment. Okay, In fact, one might argue that um, human mate selection is based on um, physical attractiveness or physical traits. And one would say that maybe a longer neck in human's case would be a disadvantage uh, because of the proportions that have been established as like um, attractive or whatever. Okay, I know I'm going on a limb there, but um, a, a giraffe born with a longer neck will be able to feed itself easier than others and will be more likely to survive and reproduce, equating to passing on his or her long neck genes to subsequent populations. Okay, if that characteristic, if that trait increases the fitness of a particular organism is going to be selected against. If a giraffe was born with a short neck, okay, the opposite side of the spectrum, then they are less likely to survive itself and therefore less likely to reproduce. Okay, That's why zero short neck alleles are currently in the giraffe population because those short necked giraffes have not for a long time been able to outcompete the long neck giraffes, therefore leading to decreased fitness, leading to essentially no reproduction, leading to no alleles in the population as a whole. Okay, Natural selection tends to eliminate from a population individuals that show low fitness, like our albino friends. Okay, uh, Albino organisms in the wild typically don't survive, therefore don't establish any natural uh, substantial populations of albino organisms. Is it possible for an albino organism to live a long and prosperous life in captivity? Absolutely, right? These albino organisms definitely can live alongside of their non-albino brethren, right? But, but they're less likely to survive in the wild, and natural selection is a wild process. Another thing that we, you know, we're kind of coming full circle, right? We started the lecture talking about the, per, the importance of out-producing um, kind of that carrying capacity with offspring. And so uh, kind of to come full circle, one of the things that Darwin noticed, and Darwin is one of the, the fathers, kind of the foundational figureheads for our theory of understand, or our understanding of the theory of evolution. But he noticed that plants and animals often produce way more offspring than could ever survive. And so why is that important? Because it has to do with the survivability of the species as a whole, not the organism. Plants often produce hundreds or thousands more seeds than necessary to propagate a species. Okay, you can actually see that right here. Why would a plant need to produce that many seeds if, if the goal is to propagate maybe one or two percent of those? And the, the, the question is, uh, or the answer is, even if one percent of those seeds are successful at reaching adulthood, this plant was successful in uh, copying itself or promoting the the betterment of the species as a whole and uh, and therefore was a successful life. Mushrooms produce millions more spores than ever grow into new mushrooms that can be seen here, right? Those are mushroom spores, essentially seeds of a fungus, and female fish and even female amphibians uh, and sometimes reptiles often will produce thousands or hundreds of eggs, but a very small number of them will actually reach adulthood and therefore reach sexual maturity. Why does this seem so wrong? Okay, when we think about humans and think about mammals, it is it is not uncommon for certain mammal species to produce one offspring. Humans are, are a perfect example of that, right? We don't overproduce by producing tons of offspring in the hope that only 1% uh, 
per, you know, live to sexual maturity, uh, we produce one, and then we put a lot of energy and resources into that to ensure that they survive. It's just a different kind of um, parenting or a different upbringing, right? But some of uh, these organisms don't don't follow the same path as, as mammals. But why would an organism spend so much energy producing seeds, spores, or eggs that will never reach sexual maturity? Okay, all of that time energy is wasted, and uh, I would say that it isn't wasted, right? To maximize the chances of some offspring surviving, even if the survival rate is less than 1%, it is important to ensure that, that a large number of organisms are available for the environment to select, and it's important for a large amount of variation within those populations of, of offspring. Okay, so uh, the video is getting kind of long, so we're going to kind of kind of high speed through the rest of this. But uh, one thing that I wanted to highlight was throughout this presentation, we've talked about competition. We've talked about the importance of promoting variation within a population. And the, the real reason or the root of ensuring that there is a large variety or a large number of varieties within a population is because the struggle is real. Right? There is a large struggle for survival that all individuals of a particular species are going to uh, come in contact with uh, in a variety of situations. And one of those things is obviously competition for food. Like It's not just competition for the acquisition of the food, but you have to find, you have to reach, you have to catch the food, you have to defend your food, you have to move the food uh, once you've consumed, like once you've found it and once you've eaten it. Um, and then you have to digest the food, right? Uh, while you're simultaneously looking for food and moving food and catching food, you have to actually keep yourself free of predators, right? Um, fighting and avoiding and escaping predation is, is a really big piece of the competition struggle. Parasitism, while you are acquiring all of these things and keeping yourself safe from predation, you have to uh, hopefully keep yourself free of parasites, right? Because the, the pickup or the acquisition of a parasite is, is really detrimental to the success or the survivability of an organism. Um, it's just one of those things where individual struggle is, is compounded, right? We have individual struggle for food, par predation, parasitism, but then also disease, like avoiding and removing tolerating disease, competition for mates. So if you've acquired the space, you've acquired uh, food, you've kept yourself free of pred predators and parasites, just finding and competing for mates is another struggle that is definitely going to compound this struggle for survival. Um, and then competition for space, right? Living space, shelter, nesting space, reproductive space, food space, all of these things are going to be kind of compounding and interrelated. You have to keep yourself um, on top of the competition, so to speak, so that you can not only survive, but reproduce and pass on your traits to offspring. So, what does natural selection look like? I have a, a specific example here that we're going to go through. Natural selection in action using my pet rats, right? These rats just naturally mutated. We have two mutated rats, right? These rats just naturally mutated using DNA replication errors, base substitution errors, or perhaps just uh, viral infection, right? We've already talked about kind of how those mutations come about, but let's assume that these two rats just naturally mutated and they are less susceptible to uh, a, a form of rat poison that when subjected to this population is really successful in killing rodents, right? And so if we subject this rat population to uh, the rat poison, notice that it kills this rat, kills this rat, kills this rat, and kills this rat. Well, if those rats go away, right, because they're obviously dead, and we allow these particular rats to reproduce, they're going to double themselves. So this uh, non-mutated rat's going to produce another one, this non-mutated rat's going to produce another one, and then these uh, less susceptible mutated rats um, that show some kind of like uh, pesticide resistance uh, are going to reproduce as well. And so you can now see that while that, that mutation was maybe 10 to 15 percent of the original population is now 50 percent of the population. Those rats that had that specific mutation were more successful against the rats that didn't have the mutation and therefore uh, were selected for. The rats that were not uh, that were susceptible, that did not have the mutation, were selected against, and we actually changed the allele frequency in our population over time. So evolution happened. Um, and so it is important to note that in this example, we cannot say that the rats became immune to the poison, although the term immunity is a, a really important concept that is sometimes interchangeably used with the term resistance. 
Um, it is not the case here because uh, immunity, actual immunity, like immunity to colds, immunity to the flu, immunity develops within a lifetime of an individual's um, uh, consistent exposure to a pathogen, whereas pesticide resistance is a change that evolves in a population from one generation of rats to the next. And so the evolution happened in the population, not in any single rat. It is impossible for a single organism to evolve. Single organisms can adapt. Single organisms can uh, mutate. Single organisms can become more or less fit, but single organisms cannot evolve. Single organisms uh, through the process or mechanism of natural selection drive the evolutionary bus, but they are not going to evolve by themselves. And just like the rats, uh, one of the things that I like to talk about when we talk about natural selection, uh, especially with human uh, impl implications, is this idea of antibiotic resistance. Right? There are uh, varieties of bacteria out there that can actually uh, or that have actually mutated rather quickly and have become antibiotic resistance. MRSA uh, is one of those, MRSA, is a strain of Staphylococcus aureus that has become completely resistant to antibiotics and is actually a big problem within kind of this idea of nosocomial infections in hospital situations around the world. Uh, but the way it works is exactly the same as any other form of natural selection outlined in the presentation, right? You have a population that is very susceptible or mainly susceptible to antibiotics, which is why antibiotics are effective, at uh, reducing population numbers within a particular population of bacteria uh, within a host organism. But just due to ran random mutation, okay, two of these bacteria cells have randomly mutated to now being uh, completely resistant or less susceptible to this form of antibiotics. And so when you subject this population to a dosage of antibiotics or a regimen of antibiotics, it is going to greatly impact the population as a whole, but uh, while it kills all or mostly all, nearly all, of the population that is susceptible to the antibiotics, it is going to leave behind the, uh, the colonies of bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics, because if they are resistant to antibiotics, they're not going to be susceptible to the an antibiotics effects. And if we are reducing the uh, the susceptible colonies, you are in effect reducing the competition with the less susceptible bacteria colonies, therefore creating an environment that is competition free that allows this strain uh, or this mutant, this mutation to prosper and over subsequent generations uh, it really establishes a population that has flipped the, the script, so to speak. You have a mainly resistant bacterial strain, uh, and uh, like I said, MRSA is one of those examples of how a bacterial colony can really reverse the script and become completely resistant through uh, killing off the natural competition that the, the susceptible bacteria colonies have. Okay. Remember, Mechanisms for bacterial antibiotic resistance that we just talked about obviously are due in large part to random mutations, but there is uh, a, a separate process that allows asexual reproducers, asexual reproducing bacteria, to actually kind of take on uh, sexual reproduction tendencies, and it's called conjugation. Okay, It's not truly sexual reproduction, but it allows plasmid transfer between bacteria cells, where essentially if we have a cell... Um, through the use of a conjugation pillus or a conjugation pili, we can take a bacterial plasmid, which is a bacterial chromosome. It's a circular ring of DNA. If this circular ring of DNA contains a gene that is uh, antibiotic resistant, so to speak, uh, through the conjugation or through the process of conjugation, one bacteria cell can actually take that plasmid and inject the plasmid into a neighboring bacteria cell and therefore can actually kind of make this bacteria cell antibiotic resistance where uh, it may not have already been. So through obviously the, the use of mutations and this idea of conjugation, one bacteria cell can really spread through asexual reproduction but also conjugation this ability to withstand treatments of, uh, of antibiotics and become antibiotic resistance. Okay. Um, I think that's where we're going to end it. See ya.